What's going on guys? This is Gene Jensen and I want to teach you everything that I know about a square build crankbait in the spring and pre-spawn. Square bill crankbaits, these little suckers right here. Um, this is a video that I've wanted to do for a very, very long time. I just never have felt like I had the confidence and the, and the knowledge to be able to make a really good square bill video. So I just never did and I kept putting it off. Well, I finally feel like I have got the confidence to be able to teach you guys what I know about these little bitty baits. I've been using them for years and they're just a great, great tool. So first of all, let's go over the the mechanics of a square bill why is it such a good bait why is it so so good shallow and why do you even dare throwing a bait that looks like this into thick cover and into lay downs and and brush piles and things like that well the reason is is because it's got a square bill and that square bill when you when you're working it along it will bump a, a limb or whatever and it will that that little angle right there on the bill will deflect that bait away from the wood and it will make that hook just glance past the wood and you won't get hung up nearly as much am I, am I saying that you'll never get hung up no you will get hung up but you won't get hung up near as much with a square bill throwing it into cover. You know, and that's really why a square bill shines so well in pre-spawn and during the spring when the bass are up shallow and they're in that cover and they're in that thick stuff because it, it looks like something they want to eat. It is a reaction bait, so when they're not in the feeding mood, they're just going to grab it just to stop it and see what it is and they're just going to react to it as it glances and bounces off of things. It's just the ideal bait for that. So let's talk about the different equipment that you need in order to fish a square bill first. The rods. Basically, two rods is what I use for square bill fishing. I've got a medium heavy moderate and I've got a medium moderate. Okay, and medium heavy moderate is 7.1 to 7.3. This one's a 7.1, but really a, a, a 7.3 will do just fine. And I use a medium heavy moderate for two things. When I want to make really long cast and cover a lot of water, which is rarely, or if I'm throwing the larger square bills like the 2.0s, and I don't have any on the boat because I don't like to throw them, but they're just, these are the 1.5s and the 2.0s are just, are just bigger and heavier. And so I, I'll throw a medium heavy moderate with those. So my medium moderate rod is always a short rod. This was a 610, I like 6.6 6 to 6.8, 6 610's 6 fine. And the reason is, is that most of my square bill fishing, especially when I'm covering, covering water and covering, you know, covering shallow water, is got to be pinpoint accurate cast. And the shorter the rod, the more accurate you are with your cast. And so I'm going to go with a 6.8, 6 6.10, and I'm just going to, you know, get it up underneath cover and get it up underneath, uh, you know, around stumps. I can just make those more accurate casts with a shorter rod. So. Um, if you were to buy one crankbait watt rod for square bill fishing, it would be a 610 medium moderate rod. Um, and, and you could pretty much do everything you, you could, you wanted to with it, except for make a really, really long cast. Why a moderate? Why a moderate action? You can, you can literally fish a square bill on any, on any rod, but in order to be able to maximize the number of fish you catch for the number of fish that bite, you've really got to have something that's going to get, have a lot of give and you'll be able to fight that fish. 75% of the time, a large percent of the time, you're not going to get a fish to take this thing all the way in its gut, you know, all the way in the, the back of its mouth. Maybe even 90% of the time, they're gonna they're gonna hook they're gonna get hooked just on the outside or just on the inside edge of the mouth or just barely in the mouth, maybe on the back hook, maybe on the front hook. And those fish, when they jump and throw their heads, they're gonna be able to throw this bait and just gain leverage. Well, with a lot of flex in that rod, 
you're going to be able to, to uh, counter that, sh that head shake. And when they shake, that rod's going to do this and it's going to keep tension on your line and they're not going to be able to throw it. So you're more likely to catch the fish with the right rod and, with a, uh, and just make sure it's a, it's a moderate action rod. So that's one. Line, 10 pound fluorocarbon, 12 pound fluorocarbon. When I use one or the other, I couldn't tell you. It's there's if I have 10 pound and I want it in and, and yes it goes a little bit deeper and and the, the bass may not see it as much but I'm not going to really fret over whether it's 10 or 12 pound line but if I'm fishing riprap which is like jagged rock that that people that, that are along dams and and uh and uh bridges and things like that I'm going to throw 12 pound just to give me a little bit more ab ab abrasion resistance and be able to catch a fish even though there may it may be a you know have a lot of uh, scuffs on it or anything or stuff like that from from cranking it through the rocks. The line that I use is this is Seaguar Brazex, and I really do worry a lot about the fluorocarbon getting you know the little curly cues and stuff like that, especially with with uh, with lipless crankbaits and square bills and things that I'm bringing through cover and stuff. And I just don't I don't I want to have the the best chance I can of not scuffing up that line. So that's why I use Seaguar Brazex just because of, of the abrasion resistance. The reel. I'm going to use a 6.3 to 1, 6.6 six to 1, somewhere around there. I consider that now a slow speed reel. When I started bass fishing many, 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 many years ago, a 6.3 to 1 was the high speed reel. There was nothing faster. But now that we have 7s and 8s and 9s and it goes up forever, um, the, the slower reel is a 6.6 six to 1. And it just seems to be a better speed. The slower that you can reel this thing in the pre-spawn and in the spawn and, and, in, and all during the spring, the better off you are of, of, for catching fish. And so a 6.6 six to 1 or 6.3 to 1 is just the ideal speed for me. This is a, a 13 Fishing Concept Boss. Um, you know, this one right here is a Concept Z. But anything, you know, just make sure it's a 6.6 six to 1 and make sure it's got a really good drag because you're going to be fighting really big fish on 10 and 12 pound line. All right, so let's talk about the different types of square bills that I'll be throwing. I'm throwing and I'm I am the one, a kind of person who just keeps things as simple as I possibly can. And so, first of all, early in the spring when the water temperatures in the 40s and 50s, I'm throwing a flat-sided square bill. And a lot of the times I'm reaching for this. This is a crush flat 75 from Six Sense. Um, I like it in just about any color they've got, but it's just a really good pre-spawn crankbait. It's not very loud. It doesn't have hardly any rattles in, at all. It's just got a, it almost sounds like it's a rubber rattle going back and forth in there. So it's not, it's very subtle. And that's kind of the stuff they're looking for early, early in the pre-spawn. Then we get into uh, a couple of the other different types that I'll use is I'll use a, this is still a flat side, but it's a little bit wider. This is a, a Spro Fat John 60 and it comes through wood really, really well just because of that wide body. Then your typical round uh, Strike King 1.5. This is a silent one, still really early in the spring. It works great. And then we got the, uh, as, it, as it starts to warm up, gets into the 60s and into the 70s, I'm gonna go with something a lot louder. And this is a, a 13 Fishing Scamp 60, and it's just super, super loud. Dives one to three feet, got a real durable bill. And so that's basically what I'm looking for when I'm looking for types of, of square bills. Nothing too fancy, just a flat side or a round one, silent or, or loud. All right, so as far as colors go, there's three different colors that I throw. There's a chartreuse when the water's stained to muddy. You know, I've got that. I've got a you know a black and chartreuse. I've got just different types of chartreuse colors. A shad color is usually what I start with if the water's stained to clear. And then springtime and to me is is almost 100% about crawfish colors. And I'm gonna pick reds and browns and, and school bus yellows. Like this color right here seems to be a really good one in the springtime. But I, to typically, those are the three colors that I'm looking at. I'm looking at crawfish, I'm looking at blue, bluegill colors, which are the chartreuse, and I'm looking at shad or baitfish colors, which are all the whites and the clears and stuff like that. Now with water clarity, um, around here in the south and most of the country nine times out of ten in the springtime you're looking at stained water you're not looking at super clear water it doesn't get clear until grass lakes get a lot of grass in them and that kind of stuff but 
But if you are forced to fish clear water, go with the clearest colored square bill that you can to start with. Now, reds work really good in clear water. Um, but but a, a clear one is always what I'm going to start with. And maybe if it's sunny or something with a little bit of flash in it, you'll be just, just fine. But for the most part, we're going to be fishing stained to muddy water. And I'm going to go with chartreuse and I'm going to go with red. All right, before I go any further, I want to talk about a piece of equipment that I keep on the boat or in my kayak 100% of the time. And it has saved me a ton of money. I don't know how many hundreds and thousands of dollars of snag crankbaits have been saved by my lure retriever. Now, this one, I'm not sponsored. I've never been sponsored. I've never talked to the owner, never nothing. This is called a Tipton's Golden Retriever. It's very plain Jane, made by some old man in his garage, and it has never failed me. If you get caught in somebody else's fishing line, which happens all the time on public lakes like the one I'm on right now, this little hook right here will go down. It'll hit your bait right there. The hook will get under that fishing line, and it will pull out and break the fishing line. I've pulled up anchor lines with this thing. I had a lipless crankbait. Matter of fact, right in a pocket right out here, it was snagged on some rope on the bottom in 15 foot of water. And I was like, I know it wasn't fishing line. So I dropped this down there and I hooked a hold of an anchor line and brought up a 15 pound anchor and my bait. So I got my bait back. It's just a really good lure retriever. But no matter what you get, have a lure retriever with you because it'll save you a ton of money. This one's like $25. What is that? Four or five baits? All right, so let's talk about hooks. I have a lot of opinion about, a very strong opinion about treble hooks and which ones to use and stuff like that. Now, as far as changing hooks out, back in the 80s and the 90s, hooks that came on plugs or on crankbaits sucked. They were horrible. And we always changed out hooks for your, um, for, for aftermarket hooks always because they just were horrible. Nowadays, the hooks that come in the box out of the box are typically really good. They don't last very long. They dole out if you're running rock and riprap, which you'll see me do here in just a little bit. Um, they'll dole out pretty quick, but they're good right out of the box. Save you some money. Just fish it right out of the box and you'll catch fish. If these fish are, I mean, you're just going to catch them. Um, just, but w when I do change them out, I'm pretty particular about the type of hook that I use um, on the crankbaits. You have two different styles. You have round bend hooks, which are on this, this crankbait right here. I'll let Jordan, Jordan zoom in. So you can see how the bend in that hook is rounded. Okay. And then you have EWGs. And I'm going to pull a red one out of my hand right here without hooking myself. This is an extra wide gap hook. You see how it's not rounded? It's, it's, it's kind of the hook hook eye or the point of the hook is pointed inward and not straight up. Sorry for shooting you guys a bird, but uh, that's, I mean, it's, these are great if the fish are taking it super deep. How often does that happen? Not very often. So I, I just steer away from these things. And, and I know a lot of people recommend them. And once you do hook them, they don't come off, but you're gonna hook more fish with a round bend hook. Now, when I do change them out, my favorite round bend hook is a Gamagatsu short shanked round bend. Okay, and I have two sizes for square bills, a six and a four. The four is bigger than the six, but I have a six and a four. This is a four short shank and this is a six short shank. Okay, and that's what I that's what I change them out to. Now, why would I change them out? If they get dulled, if they get bent, of course. If they get rusty like this one right here, I, uh, my, my last tackle boxes would fill with water and I always had rust issues. Um, even though they were really good boxes, they just always seem, seem to get, you know, get water in them. But when I, another reason I would change them out is, is anybody who's fished a square bill has had one where the two hooks somehow find their way hooked together and they come in like this. You're never going to catch a fish with your two hooks hooked together. So the first thing I'll do is I'll pull this one off and I'll put a number four. This is a number four long shank. I'll put a number four short shank on there and that'll prevent that. Um, another thing I might do is, is, uh, it's change out the, the back one with a little bit smaller hook uh, sometimes, but I usually go four and four on the, uh, I stay the same size as the one that came on the bait. Now, if you're fishing something super small like this one, 
you know, this one you're going to change out to a six. And I want to, I would definitely, this one is one that gets hung a lot. And what's funny is you can get them hung, there we go, get them hung casting just like this. But sometimes this is next impossible to, to hang them up to yourself. But uh, I would change this one out to a short shank for or number six and it would be just fine. So one of the most convenient tips that I have when for any crankbait fishing and square bills is, is no exception is when you pull them out of the box, you've got the package there. The package tells you what depth it, uh, it fishes, but nine times out of 10, except for 13 baits that have the depth written on the bill, there's no depth on the bait. So take a Sharpie, a little fine uh, tip Sharpie and write the depth underneath the, the chin. If you write it here, it won't get rubbed off. If you write it up, write it up here, it will get rubbed off eventually. So I always try to write it just under the chin of the, of the, of the bait to keep, uh, to keep it on there a little bit longer. So, but write it down there because that's critical. You're going to be fishing zero to eight feet of water. If you have a bait that runs three to four feet and you're fishing eight feet of water, you're not going to catch any fish. So you really need to know how deep it's going to dive. The, a question I get asked a lot is about clips or about swivels um, or snaps as people call them. My, my suggestion with snaps is if you are a fan of snaps, and I am when I'm looking for the right crankbait to throw, when I'm switching and switching and switching, I'm a fan of snaps. But if I was somebody that really always wanted to wear snap or wear snaps, <laughs> oh, when I was somebody that always wanted to use snaps, I would, the first thing I would do is I would take a pair of, of, uh, of cutters and I would cut the, the split ring or I'd take the split ring off of every one of my crankbaits and I would go straight snaps. Um, just because they having the the split ring and having the snap on there at the same time tends to change the action quite a bit and it can really mess up the action the action of your bait now what kind of snaps do I use let me pull them out on a side note if anybody has a tackle box that all of the little things get thrown all over your box these new spro or these new uh, um, Plano boxes are really good for keeping little tiny stuff because these the the tops of their boxes except when you throw them up throw your stuff all over it but the tops of the boxes are flush with the with the lid and so you, your stuff doesn't go bouncing around from compartment to compartment but anyway so the snaps that i use basically these these are called duo snaps and i use the the uh, the spro duo snaps and uh they are they come in like three different sizes, big, medium, and small. And I use the small, smallest ones they make. And I just, I cut off the, swivel, the, the split ring. I put them on there and I fish them. It can be a pain in the neck if you have to cut off all your split rings and all of a sudden you realize you want your split rings back on there. And I've done that too. But the duo snaps are the way to go if you love to change crankbaits out a lot and you don't want to retie. Now, I would suggest that you retie often or you'll lose a lot of baits, but... It's neither here nor there. It's just a question I always get asked. I want to talk a little bit about when you would throw a square bill. A square bill is really good from the time the water temperature gets to about 45 degrees early in the spring, and it can last all year long as long as your fish are shallow. Um, but what we're talking about in this video is we're talking from that 45 degree mark all the way up to the 72, 73 degree mark. Actually, let's go further than that 75 degree mark. So it covers the pre-spawn, the spawn, and then the, the shad spawn or your bait fish spawn. But, uh, and that's, we're gonna fish it the same way all three times. We're just gonna change the, the speed in which we're fishing it, depending on the water color or the water temperature. If it's really cold, we're gonna, we're gonna reel it really slow. And as it warms up, we're gonna go a little faster and a little faster and get a little louder and a little louder, a little bit more in your face. And you'll, uh, you'll catch fish throughout that whole period of time. Now, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to, I'm going to put a link right up here, this little eye with a little circle with the eye in it that we call them cards here on YouTube. But, uh, I'm going to put that up there and it's a link to how I fish pre-spawn or I'm going to put as many pre-spawn videos as I can up there. So you guys can go and see the details of the pre-spawn and what you're looking for and things like that. So I don't have to go over it again and again in this video. So, um, but the places that I'm going to throw a, a square bill in the pre-spawn are going to be those places that I, that I cover in those videos, you know, towards the backs of creeks and pockets, um, along riprap in, 
in cover shallow. As these fish are moving back to the, to the spawning flats, you're going to be throwing, they're going to be up shallow, they're going to be moving along the bank, and you're going to be hitting those, those spots and those places and those areas that are going to hold those bass. Um, and that's why a square bill comes in handy because a lot of times those areas are really full of snags and, and, the, and yeah, you can flip a, a creature bait in there and maybe catch uh, two or three, but if you start to catch them on a square bill crank bait in a spot, you're going to catch almost every fish in that school. And so that's why it's so, it's such a nice bait to throw this time of year. So let me put this mess of, of square bills away and grab a couple of rods. Let me get up and, and, and just run this bank and kind of show you guys how I fish a square bill and how to fish them on the different types of cover and structure and things like that that you have in the water. All right, so pre-spawn square bill fishing and cold water square bill, square bill fishing. I'm, I'm telling you, I feel like the most important thing is the speed in which you fish it. Every crankbait, every style, every brand seems like it has a specific speed in which it performs the best. And finding that speed sometimes can be difficult, but it's just a matter of playing around with it. And I always start super, super slow. As soon as I can feel tension on that line is that's the speed I'm going to go. So I'm going to throw it out, get it hung in a tree, bring it back in, throw it out another time, <laughs> but I'm going to throw it out here and I'm literally going to just start to turn it about this slow, really, really slow. And I'm going to try that for a little bit and I may speed up. I may pop my rod just a hair, but I'm just going to go really slow and try to bump it through whatever cover I'm, I'm, I'm fishing. And that's really important. Speed and deflection. You're going to get those reaction strikes from these fish when right after you hit something, right after you hit a stump or a rock or even just the bottom, a clay bottom. As soon as you hit something, that's when you should expect a bite. So I'm going to reel it through these stumps. I'm going to bump a stump. I'm going to halfway stop it, just not a total stop. I'm just going to kind of do this. And I'm just going to reel it back in really, really slow. And as the water warms up, I can get away with faster and louder and more obnoxious baits. But as it's really cold, really slow, seems to be the ticket. Now, as you're covering the bank, um, this is when a, a short 6.6 six or, or 6.8, six, 6.10 six, rod really works well, is you've got to be able to get it into these really narrow spots and not get them snagged. And you're covering a lot of water. You're just looking for that one, that, you know, a lot of times, especially as they get closer to the spawn like they are right now, um, it's a little, they're a little bit more scattered out. You're not going to find them grouped up. But you're looking for that one little spot that those fish are hanging on. And so a nice low cast, very accurate, is almost key when you're fishing banks that look like this. Now we get down to the riprap, it's gonna be a little bit different. But then again, if you're casting out and you're reeling in and you're not bumping anything, change to a deeper diving crankbait until you start to bump stuff. Now grass, if you're fishing a lake that has a lot of grass, um, a lot of times this time of the year, you'll have a little bit of tuft, you know, a little bit of short grass down on the bottom in the shallow water. And if your water warms up fast, it's going to start growing a little bit faster. But if, if you're buried in the grass, you're fishing too deep. But if you're coming back and you don't feel your bait ticking the tops of the grass, you're too shallow. You want to get that bait to where it's going to fish right at the tops of that grass and just tick the top of the grass that's in the shallow water. And a lot of times you can adjust that depth by just lifting your rod. Say I'm, I'm buried in the grass a little bit. Oh, this lake has no grass. Let me go ahead and tell you that, none whatsoever. So I'm just kind of telling you guys, or showing you guys. But if you found yourself burying in the grass, bring your rod tip up about halfway. And even, even higher if you're having more of an issue, and it'll get your bait up a little bit higher in that water column. And you play around with how high you lift your rod tip until you start to feel it tick the grass. All right, here we go. We're coming up on one of the scariest things for a crankbait fisherman, a lay down. Oh no, we might get hung up. Let me show you how to fish one of these things. Okay, first thing is you notice the trunk of the tree is in the water. I love it because, but it's not laying on the bottom. I love them being in the water like that because the bass will get right up underneath them. I'm gonna throw to the corner right up in there is the first place I'm gonna cast. And I'm, it's almost too late for me to do that. And then I'm gonna throw right along the trunk. Now, let me reposition the boat and get it out away from the tree. But the main place I'm going to focus on are these, the ends of this tree. The active fish, the ones that are going to bite no matter what time of the year are going to be out on the ends in the limbs. 
and a square bill is perfect for this. I'm gonna throw right up against the log. I'm gonna let the boat drift just a little bit and I'm gonna go and bump the outside tips of all of those limbs with this square bill and I just hit every single one of them. Now, if you have a tree, which is very rare, if you have a tree where you are standing at the root ball or standing at the trunk and you're throwing up and the limbs are on the other side, don't fish. You're going to get snagged, I promise you. So make sure that you're fishing from the end in or the end to the, to the, uh, uh, to the root ball. Now, I just threw right in the middle. I just came over that first big limb just came over to the second one and I just kept reeling. I wasn't worried about getting hung because a square bill is not going to get hung up. So throw to the inside corner, throw to the limbs, and then throw alongside the trunk of the tree and you're going to get bit one of the three places if there's a fish there. So like I've said, like I said before, as that water temperature starts to, to warm up and starts to get into the, the spawning time of the bass, which is you know high 50s, low 60s, um, I'm going to start speeding up just a hair, but as they start to spawn, I find that just going a little bit slower and making multiple casts uh, works the best. So say, for instance, I'm fishing an area that's super muddy. Now, Kevin Van Dam won a Bassmasters Classic this way, so that's why I'm, I'm talking about this. But it is, it is a, a very, very cool way of catching spawning bass when you can't see them. It was really muddy down in Louisiana. There were stumps in this area that he was fishing, and he would fan cast and fan cast until he'd hit one of those stumps and almost every one of those stumps had a bass on it and so he once he would hit a stump he would anchor down and make cast after cast after cast after cast at that stump until he'd get bit and and he was reeling super super slow he'd reel it up to that stump bump 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 it and try to bump it as many times as he could on that pass. And it would just basically piss him off and he'd catch the fish. And that's, I love to catch uh, bass on stumps in pre-spawn and spawn with a square bill. It's just so much fun because you know, once you hit that stump within a split second, you're gonna get bit. Um, and it's just exciting. It's almost like a jig bite for me. It's just thumping. I'm like, oh, where's it? And then you just hope that the bass is gonna bite after you bump that stump. But, and when they're spawning, hit their spawning areas multiple times. Once you bump something that they might be spawning on again and again and again, just keep hitting it. And you don't have to see the bed to fish them. That's all right. <laughs> I wasn't really fishing. Now, you guys remember when I said that that nine times out of 10, you seem like you just barely catch the fish. And that's true here too. If I'd have had EWG hooks, I probably would not have caught that fish. And if I'd have had a stiffer rod, he probably would have shake, shaken it. I know that's not a big one, but I was just running the bank trying to get down to where I wanted to fish again. And I caught a little bonus guy, but yeah, that's, you gotta have the right hooks. Now, another thing I just did is I switched to a bait that dives a little bit deeper. That, that uh, 13 fishing scamp dove 1, 3, or 1 to 3 feet, and this one dries, dives 3 to 5 feet. And I, I didn't catch that fish until I was out in about 4.5 feet of water. Now, one thing you do want to make sure is you want to make sure your diving depth is a little deeper than what the bottom is if you're, if you're hitting the bottom like I am right now. So my depth um, under the boat right now, well, we're not going to talk about that. It's 10 feet, but this is a, a pretty steep little bank. And I want to be able to hit the bank or hit the bottom in five, three to five feet of water. And that's why I switched over to that. But that's key. You got to be hitting something. So change your baits out to a deeper bait if you're not hitting the bottom. All right, another key thing this time of the year is boat positioning. Um, I want to be where I can make a parallel cast to the, to the, to the shoreline depending on how deep I want to be. I want to be out in five feet of water if I'm going to be casting and fishing in five feet of water. That way I keep the bait in the strike zone for the longest possible time. Plus, if there is a feeding bass, it's going to want to, it's more apt to hit the bait if he can pin it up against the bank. So get as close as you can to the shoreline. Even bank fishermen, you guys can rock doing this thing. You just work the bank and just parallel it. But that's all I'm doing is I'm staying as close as I can to the bank and making parallel cast along the bank. I'm not throwing to the bank and bringing it out deep. That just, you just don't get as many bites that way. So I'm really just trying to stay as close as I can without rubbing the boat and the motor and everything else. 
but that's key. That's, that's boat positioning 101 for uh, covering water with square bills or any kind of moving bait. So behind me is my favorite thing to fish with a square bill or any crankbait, as a matter of fact, is riprap, is rock. You get hung up a little bit, but you catch a snot out of fish on this stuff and a square bill is ideal for it. Same thing as covering any other bank. I'm gonna let the boat get as close up as I possibly can. It's gonna be a little bit more difficult with the wind blowing the way it is, but I'm gonna throw as shallow as I dare and I'm just gonna slowly reel it. Now talking about speed again, if you are fishing a crankbait too fast, a lot of times it will roll on its side. And if you find yourself getting hung up a lot, it's because you're probably fishing it too fast. Because it rolls up on its side and it gets snagged easier. It just tends to be a, a little bit, a, <laughs> it tends to be a pain in the butt is what it tends to be. So I'm gonna throw real close to the shore. Like I said, this is gonna be a little bit more difficult because the wind's blowing into these rocks, but that's really, the fish should be here because of that but I'm just gonna cover and try to bang these rocks as much as I possibly can. Real shallow. I got my line wrapped around because I hit a log in the air. But you wanna fish so slow and so methodical that you're, you feel everything. You feel a, the line run up the rock before you bump it or up the log. Focus is everything. Man, if you're trying to if you're trying to hold a conversation while you're square bill fishing, you're not going to catch every fish that you possibly can with a square with any kind of a crankbait. But you really have to stay completely focused on this. That is so critical. Um, just making a video and trying to figure out how I'm going to teach you guys. I know I'm going to have a hard time catching fish if I'm running my mouth. But if I sit here very quietly and I just pay attention to everything that that bait is doing, it's. <laughs> you're going to catch fish and that's also why a, a sense a good sensitive graphite rod is critical and a lot of people say well you got to throw a, a crankbait on a a, a, gla a glass rod glass rods are not sensitive and i'm going to be the first one to tell you don't do that there's the the technology in graphite these days is so good that you don't have to worry about a glass rod anymore again that's my opinion but eh, i fish every day <laughs> all right so when you're fishing deeper cover that you can't see there's you'll you'll get to the point and it's not hard to figure this out but you'll be able to feel the line coming over top of whatever you're about to hit with your crankbait and you'll know about when that crankbait's about to hit so you can kind of know when to not stop the biggest thing is is when you're hitting stuff you don't want to stop until after you hit it and so there's a lay down somewhere about four feet deep right here and i'm gonna reel over to it okay so I feel my line coming up and it's just a different feeling. You feel it coming up and then all of a sudden, boom, and as soon as it bumps, I just do a split second stop. Boom. And then I just keep reeling. And what that did is it just hit that stick, backed up into the fish's mouth if there's a fish there, and it just kept on going. And the fish is gonna chase it and eat it. And then, as you're trying to catch fish on a square bill, your son picks up a Texas rig. <laughs> oh, it is what it is. That's awesome. Got it. It's gonna go down. All right, as far as hook sets go, they are so important and they're a little bit different with crankbaits, especially square bills. Um, I. I got two different type of hook sets that I use when they're just crushing it. When I've got a, a school turned on or if I'm, if I'm really, they're really into the bait that I'm using and they hit it hard, I'm gonna pull hard, I'm, but it's a low sweeping hook set and you just pull into them, but you pull in them, into them with some force. Now, most of the time they just kind of load up on it and it just feels like maybe, you may feel the bump when they hit, they hit it, but you, it just feels like they're just a little bit lethargic and they're a little bit slow. And I'm going to match that hook set. I'm going to throw out, I'm going to, when, when they bite, I'm literally just going to slowly pull into it to see if it's a fish and then just start reeling them in. They'll hook themselves. If you rip it like a Texas rig uh, hook set, you know, just jerk it as hard as you can, you're going to jerk that bait out of, their, out of their mouth. And it's amazing how six hooks on a bait can, can miss the fish but it happens. So make sure you get your hook set right. Now, all the baits that I've used, all the tackle, everything else, just like every other video, video, there's gonna be links down in the description to tackle warehouse, warehouse where you can pick it up. Um, 
This month is being sponsored by Georgia 811. Dial 811 before you dig in your yard so you don't cut utility lines and you don't cost yourself thousands of dollars. Real simple, real easy. I appreciate them sponsoring this month. Um, but uh, I'm doing a giveaway. Click the link in the description and you can have a chance to win a fish a fishing trip with me. Compliments of 811. And, uh, and that's it. Well, like I always say, be sure to introduce somebody to fishing. Introduce them to my channel. Let me help you teach them how to fish. More importantly, get out on the water. Go ahead and catch some fish and have a great day. We'll see you.